So if you get up like close to it like this, it's it's not gonna get so if you stay back a little bit, you And it'll follow me if I go yeah. over here. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So it's not just your vocal sounds, but it's your tracks. It works so well. So she's made the piece of It's a great thing to do this for. Oh my gosh, how are you? No, no. I am so happy. I'm so So we had this actress that played like Oh, so your mama gave one of very good I was up in the She got the She did not get the film. 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 She did not get the She did She did not get the She did not get Yes, 
Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. I want to welcome everybody in the room and online to the Dean's Lecture Series. Today is a special treat for me, uh, especially because a long dear friend of mine, Jane Oates, has um, agreed to be our speaker today. Um, we go way back 25 years at Tufts University where I started my career in higher education, so did you, right? Exactly right. Uh, we worked at the uh, Mid-Atlantic Laboratory for Student Success. Um, we worked on innovative education programming in the schools in the community. And with that, I'm going to give you a little history of where she went to and became since being at Temple. Um, Jean was nominated by President Barack Obama um, to be the Assistant Secretary of Employment and Training in 2009. And she led the Employment and Training Administration, ETA, in its mission to design and deliver high quality training and employment programs for our nation's workers. Prior to that appointment, Jane served as Executive Director of the New Jersey Commission on Higher Education and Senior Advisor to Governor John S. Corzine. Jane served for nearly a decade as Senior Policy Advisor to the Massachusetts Senator Edward M. Kennedy. And Jane began her career as a teacher in Boston and in Philadelphia Public Schools. And as I said later, I met her at Temple at the Laboratory for Student Success. And so with that, I'm honored to have Jane here. And you always have to remember who your friends are. You know, you're going to go and ask to become. So with that, Jane, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's so fun to be here. Uh, what Penny didn't tell you is I'm a girly girl. Mm -hmm. Grew up in the Jesu Parish, and then my my family moved. So that's for those of you who don't know, 17th and Gerard, and then moved to uh, Mayfair to St. Anne's Parish, and uh, went. Doesn't matter, you know, if you're Jewish or Muslim or Protestant or Catholic. Everybody in Philadelphia still talks about parishes. Uh, I went to high school here in West Philadelphia, 39th and Chestnut, which is the first time I met Penn, and the first time I met Drexel. Uh, Drexel was a very different place then, uh, the, the, the uh, kind of second cousin to higher ed here in Boy Look at where it's from. You should be very proud to be here. You're going to hear me make a lot of uh, Drexel references today because I think so highly of the university that Drexel has become, and I thought very highly of it uh, when I was here as a student. We would take science courses uh, because my high school was very small and we would sometimes use uh, so the campus then was Market Street. Now it's everywhere. You know, it's, it's a global campus. Um, so Penny did such a nice job. I, I should tell you that uh, I more than grew up here. I came back after teaching in Boston uh, because of Senator Kennedy. I moved back to do this presidential campaign, but campaigns didn't pay very well then. So I still remained a teacher. And I taught for not a year or two years, but for 14 years at Stetson Junior High at the in Allegheny. Uh, I was amazed last night when I walked past the museum here to see the Kensington opioid exhibit. Mm -hmm. What a frightening thing. But you know, the beautiful thing about Stetson uh, was not the building, uh, or the families and the community, because at that point, when I started teaching there in the 78, um, Kensington and Stetson was a third white, a third African-American, and a third Latino probably the only place in the city where you could get that kind of mix. And you saw both all the promise and the opportunity of that rich diversity, and you also saw the challenges. You know, and uh, if we had just done better, Penny, don't, let, don't ever let Penny sell herself short. She was the most brilliant person I worked with at Temple. We worked on a woman named Margaret Wong, who was terrific. And uh, Penny did research in science. Uh, mostly then, but really committed to teachers. How do we give teachers the kind of expertise they need so that they can be the expert in the classroom that they need to be? And some of her work, I was just talking about Sisters in Science this morning, which she did with the William Penn Cluster at the time. And then we took it national, really, and regional. And I can't tell you, I could tell you, but I won't, how many road trips we went on taking it to places like rural Delaware, you know, where um, science meant something very different. It was food and agricultural science, and Penny could on the, you know, maybe it was the, the background from receptacle you got, but she could turn on a dime and say, okay, well, let's talk about agricultural science. Let's talk about what chemistry means, which she was brilliant and still is. So 
Uh, I'm delighted to be here, but really delighted uh, because I would do anything for, for Penny. <laughs> and I have another um, Drexel connection. I am a lifelong admirer. You heard that I worked for Senator Kennedy. Well, when I worked for Senator Kennedy, there was a labor market economist named Paul Harrington, and the other school that does co op, Northeastern. <laughs> so, Paul Harrington has been uh, such a valued professional resource to me my whole life. He taught me what labor market information was, and the fact that I could transition from a teacher to a researcher to uh, a SHEO, you know, the head of higher ed, but could. In Senator Kennedy's eyes, transferred into an expert on workforce is in no small part of the parenting. I'm sorry you can't be here with us today, but I want you to rush his wife. His wife is here. I'm so delighted that she could be here. But don't tell him I said he's the nicest. Guy. <laughs> you know, I don't see enough of him, so I want him to feel guilty that he wasn't here. So we'll have to see him. But uh, you know, you're going to. I'm going to reference him when I'm talking about resources. So uh, why would Penny invite me? I've spent. I'm now the president of a nonprofit media organization called Working Nation, and its whole mission is to bring the stories of solutions uh, to the field of work. You know, so where are people getting the right training so that they can at 22 or 18 enter the workforce for the first time, or they can transition from being a stay-at-home dad or stay-at-home mom back into the workforce? Or the saddest part for me is when life is the rug, is, the rug of life is pulled out from under you, and you're just looking. You lose your job, you lose your profession, and you have to re-educate yourself and really reinvent yourself. So understand my biases. You know, teaching is a big part of who I am, and I would tell you that the courses that I took as a teacher, the life lessons, I could still name the professors and undergraduate. You don't, I don't want you to wonder how old I am. I'm 65, I started teaching in 1975, and I can still tell you uh, the names of the professors who shaped my, shaped my life and the experiences that made me the lifelong learner that I am today. I would not be who I am today, I would not have had any of these fancy titles uh, if I hadn't had the grounding in being what I think of as a teacher. And I was only an excellent teacher because of the people who taught me. So, Huge kudos to all of you for staying in this profession. And please know everything I say, I understand the job you have, but it's, it's got to get bigger. So um, to start this, technology is moving into the classroom. What does that mean? You know, I remember when I was assessing the first computers we got, and quite frankly, the assistant principal used it as a plan to stand. <laughs> it tells you that we didn't get the necessary preparation the necessary training, the necessary understanding about how to use it. And while we all wrote grants to the NEIU unit to get computers in our classroom, we didn't really know what it was either. I mean, we didn't have the kind of software that's out there today. We didn't know that it could be used to personalize learning. Remember, I left teaching in 1990 to go to Temple. And really, the, the piece for, in the early 90s, the piece for me is that if teachers had just known how to use it, they wouldn't have been but teacher ed programs back then, in the 80s and the 90s, weren't including machine-based learning in what they were doing. You still had to know everything else. You still had to know the pedagogy. You still had to know, you know, classroom management. You still had to know the database stuff about the subjects that you could teach. And I should have said, I'm a special ed teacher by training. Uh, so we had to know all subjects. How ridiculous was that? <laughs> but the the piece of technology that's moving into the classroom that I think we sometimes forget, it's not the hardware and the software that I'm talking about, it's the mindset. How do teachers not feel threatened by the fact that if a school hasn't banned cell phone or tablet use since too many have, if they haven't banned it, the teacher can get back checked every step of the way. So we have to prepare our teachers not to do technology as the enemy. Back when I was teaching, my professors would tell me, tell me don't see television that day. You know, it, engage television because it's getting your audience. Technology has this audience. Every teacher that's out there today is teaching digital natives. And if you make technology your enemy, put that cell phone away, don't use it, and you don't teach them how to use it, you as a teacher don't teach them how to use it the right way, you're not going to be done. You know, you're not preparing them for the world. And they're going to think you're a dinosaur. They go, they're going to think you're antiquated, regardless of your age. And by the way, I don't think of age 
as the only thing that makes you a technology person. Because while I call anybody under 25 a digital native, some of them don't know how to use technology any better than I do. And I have met some octogenarians who are really efficient users of technology. So understand that I'm not using age as this, but I am saying that many people that are 40 and teaching probably haven't had the opportunities that some of the 22 year olds have in terms of making technology a part of their life. So, and when we're talking about this technology, we've got to inform people. I was always a big believer that work had to be part of, I'm a special ed teacher, right? So work had to be part of everything I said to kids every day. You know, this is going to help you when you X. And if kids like, uh, I will tell you I was uh, an odd teacher uh, because I wasn't going to give a 14-year-old kid with a beard uh, mock the pop, the cop book <laughs> kind of book. You know, I mean, we weren't going to do word linguistics kinds of things talk about how stupid they were. Instead, they learned how to read using driver's map. Most of my kids, when I was at Stetson, the test for them was could you pass the written driver's You know, because that was real. We did other things, but the driver's manuals were always in my room. And that's how we taught vocabulary, because it was real to them. And they understood that for many jobs in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2019, you have to have driver's license. We believe that prison reform and other, you know, criminal mm -hmm. justice reform another day when they can't get their driver's license, but that's not for today. So we need to talk to kids about how what they're learning is going to impact how they're going to work. So I put these things up there because these are things that are happening today, and they're only going to get more prevalent. Gig work is a polite term for you don't have a steady job. Mm -hmm. That you're working on contract. Everybody in the you know. Everybody in this room has been gig workers their whole career, right? They're called adjunct faculty, right? They work at, at Drexel, but they could work at Penn, they could work at CCP, they could work anywhere, they could work across the river. So if we don't say to kids, if you don't learn how to do math, 92%, this is a, God rest his soul, uh, Alan Kruger and uh, Andy Clark statistic. 92% of the jobs that were created between 2010 and 2018 were big work. They were contract work, they were temporary. Of the new jobs, there's still plenty of the traditional jobs. But what does that mean for 2020 to 2030? Are employers going to get so comfortable in this that they keep doing it? And if we haven't talked to kids at all, you know, if their mom works for SEPTA and their dad works for the city, they don't know what we're talking about when we say big work. And we have to get them ready for it. The same way we have to get them, you know, I put remote work over there. Many of them have seen that because they see it on students. You know, teachers can work remotely or uh, only, only uh, essential personnel need to report everyone else can work remotely. They understand that word a little better, but they don't understand gig. They don't understand that you're going to have to know how to do your quarterly taxes or you're going to pay a big time. They don't understand that project management is one thing when you come to work on Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning and work till 6 o'clock at night, and it's different when you have two jobs to do between that same time. And, you know, if you can say to them, the reason that we're teaching you as prospective teachers to do project-based learning instead of just doing regular tasks is because the kids you teach are going to be project-based workers. There is a high probability that they are going to be project-based rather than employee-based. It's a huge paradigm shift. And if teachers aren't at least aware of that, that that's coming, they can't prepare their kids. And if the parents can't prepare them and the teachers can't prepare them, what's going to happen to us? And today, we have a 63% labor market participation rate. That means that 37% of the people are sitting out and not working. If people don't understand how to get in and hustle, in this gig work and, and this new economy, that's going to go down, and you don't want to live in a country where we have this work. I certainly don't because I can't work much longer. <laughs> but I think the next thing here is hybrid jobs. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, as a teacher, I would often say, again, my population was different. I would say, well, you could go into healthcare, and here are the jobs that St. Christopher's Hospital has, Children's Hospital has, Penn has, what now? You know, these are the kinds of jobs you could prepare for. Or you could go into banking, 
or you could go, and I would go through these things. You could work for the city, you could work for an like, institution back then, like Scottsdale or Sears, Sears in Philadelphia. I would go through those things. But now, working for a company is not a single job market. It's really a hybrid. So you want to be a tech worker, and some people may think of Google or Microsoft or Apple, tech companies, right? So they know the companies that are in the tech verticals, and they can probably name them, but they don't understand that tech is also a horizontal. But you can go into cybersecurity and work for Target, or you can go into cybersecurity and work for the city. And if teachers can't talk a little bit about this, how do they get these kids ready for it? They think there's a single linear pathway to work at X. It's not true. It is a very jagged thing. And in a city like Philadelphia, where many of your students come from, but not all, I know that. But in a city like York, where we're lucky enough to be right now, with a 27% poverty rate, we cannot afford not to give every single kid the biggest look at what their world of opportunity is. We just can't afford it. So, and, and I would say that if I were in Baltimore, I would say it if I were in Washington, D.C., but I would also say it if I were in Florida. Or I would say it if I were in a rural community in Nebraska. Because every single community, regardless of their poverty rate, is looking at a void of information like we've ever seen before. I heard a statistic a few weeks ago, and this way I'm glad Linda's here, I'm not Paul, because Paul would probably correct me. But I heard someone in Washington at the American Enterprise Institution give this statistic. And he said that 90% of the data that we have today, all the data that we have, <coughs> has been created in the last so think about that when you think about the speed of information that's coming at people. Think about when we first started using the internet. Couldn't find anything, right? I mean, thank goodness for search engines, and I can go back all the way to ask Jeeves. You know, so I've been mean, around searching for a long time. But I mean, you think about how it was just so overwhelming. And but that's every day. We have that much data coming at us every day. How do we teach our teachers? to teach their students how to be good consumers of data. It used to be just telling kids that you couldn't use Wikipedia as a source, right? But and when you're doing a research paper. But now you really have to teach them to be smart consumers, and many of our teachers have put it in the We think they're going to get it on their own. These are really smart and really resilient. But they're already working 15 hours a day to both teach and get ready for their classes and continue their own learning in the pedagogy that they decide. So we have to help them with that as we're doing them. And you know, all these other things, I mean, I think that the last one I'll stop for a few, uh, a few minutes, I think the, the global team piece, where Penny and I were talking today, I think Drexel is uniquely positioned to talk about that. You know, because you're global, you have a global footprint. Your heart is in Philadelphia, but you are everything. And if you think about getting the teachers to think about that. I know many of them are going abroad and to different places in the United States to do their student teaching. I know many of them are online. But if you think about this, this global team concept, I mean, I can remember when we first started traveling, I was having a hard time with one time. You know, like thinking, if it's nine o'clock here, what time is it where we're going? You know what I mean? If you think about it now, there's not a company that I work with today that's not in more than one. And many of them are And that what that means, both in you know in time zones, absolutely, but in cultural competencies. How do we infuse in our future teachers the fact that whether you choose to remain living in Philadelphia, and there are parts of Philadelphia where if you don't go out of your neighborhood, you may not see diversity, but the bottom line is you wherever you work, there's going to be diversity. So you've got to be ready and armed to understand cultural competencies. Some people, you know, I mean, I used to explain to kids, look, I'm a hugger, and I'd probably be in a big problem if I were a guy in the Me Youth movement, I hope not. But, you know, even uh, male teachers would say to me, well, you can get away with hugging a boy, but if I hug a girl, it's a problem. Even in the 80s and 90s. But you've got to say to people that it's about maybe forcing people to continue to make eye contact is really hard for them because of their culture. You know, maybe having three earrings in their ear instead of one is something that comes as a part of them, and it doesn't come from their country of origin or, you know, the neighborhood they live in, but it's who they are. And that 
understanding culture within societal norms. I mean, people can't come in and debate to, you know, do a job interview unless I mean, maybe you can do sports illustrate. I don't know. But it, you, know, you have, but you have to say you've got to understand other people's cultures. It's not enough to just understand. It. And today, I think we see that uh, so dramatically and so tragically in the anti anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, anti-Black, anti-Hispanic, anti-immigrant. You know, if it weren't for immigrants, I wouldn't have to go through my parents were first generation. And it just so happened that they came from a country that's both English and white. So what? They were still immigrants. So, you know, I'm not I'm not suggesting that um, teachers should be social workers in the profession, but their job is to teach, and that's a full-time job we can. But if they don't understand that they set a culture in their classroom, and a community that's either accepting of different cultures or rejecting of different cultures, they don't get it. It's not about putting their people in. You know, it really is about creating a climate where everyone's viewpoint is respected and everyone's preferences are understood and respected. So I think I think that's really important. And then this last part, this is hard for teachers. And I, uh, two weeks ago, I was with all the superintendents of the Orange County schools in California, and they said to me, it's, and that's the reason I put it like this, competencies versus degrees. It's not versus, it's at. I mean, we need to make sure that teachers are accepting of kids getting certificates, exposure, experiences online, as well as in person, and that they welcome those into the classroom. So if somebody, let's take a really easy one, it's Microsoft Office certified. That should be celebrated in the classroom. That should say, you know, tell me for a minute, how hard was that? And did you? And maybe other people want to do it. How much did it cost? You know, if they get certified in ACE and auto mechanics, I don't care whether you're the calculus teacher. You should celebrate that they got that certification because getting an ACE certification or a welding certification or anything else. And I do have a president that the academic, the technical, and career sides of the house need to come together like never before. But it should be celebrated both as an academic achievement and a personal achievement. Because you did just like, I don't care how you feel about the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, but getting a badge told you that you did something that you had to do and you got there. Those should be celebrated. Should already 52 minutes in class, 47 minutes in class, whatever it is, I don't want to take teaching time, but we should find a way to celebrate that and not say it's an either or, because obviously you are going to get your high school diploma. What else can you add to your repertoire as you get your high school diploma? I'm a third grade teacher. Obviously, I want you to graduate to fourth grade. You're going to get that certificate as we move you up into fourth grade. But what else can you do while you're here so that we're enriching your experiences and your accomplishments? So, um, you know, all these things, we could spend a day on each one of these, right? These things all say the same. Uh, time is the biggest enemy of the teacher. That bell, I used to hate it. What do you mean it's the biggest enemy You know, but the bell is a reality. Curriculum must, things that, you know, your role book is a must. You have to learn how to do that. If you don't do that, you will get written up and you'll be denied the opportunity to express yourself as a teacher. I mentioned bulletin boards. You know, your bulletin boards have to be attractive. All of those are musts, as well as curriculum musts that you're like, why am I still doing this? Why is this still in the fourth grade curriculum? I shouldn't have to go back. And I think the biggest must is reviewing previous year's work. You know, when I was teaching, and I was last in a classroom probably six weeks ago, So, and I try to get in. I usually go in with junior achievement, but I try to go in with whatever reason I can go in, just so I don't get completely detached. But the idea that we spend the whole month of September every year reviewing what you learned last year is a waste of time. If Singapore did that, they'd be where we are with this. You know, just the bottom line. And we collect the books in May, and we make the kids sit in seats till June. Oh. What what do you do? You know, it, it, it's just insane. So we have to train our teachers. We have to be very honest about that. Even if you're in a very progressive school district, a high achieving school district, the best school in your district, whatever it is, those two things are always the same. We need to train our prospective teachers in how do you accelerate the review process? Could we use technology? Could we use teams? Could we you take the book from last year and have teams break up in the room and say, what did you do? You don't remember at all? Could we do a pretest? 
you know, to say to the kids, I'm giving you a test on third grade math, we're gonna see what you remember, and all of you aren't gonna be reviewing third grade because we're just gonna go back and have, who forgets how to carry when they're at it? Let's go back and review that, but the whole class doesn't have to wait. The whole class doesn't have to be, because you don't have to make people feel sorry. Well, you can do problem solving activities while you do short term remediation with certain people. And if you did high intensity spot remediation, you could get there much faster than 20 school days in the You know, I mean, it, it just works. And if you're thinking all year, if your school is one that collects the books and makes sure they're clean and take the covers off and pack them away and all that, which is 99% of the schools in America, then you need to think about what are the things I could do. Who are the people that I could plan today to have in my class the first week in June so they could give them a heavy dose of real world? You know, who could I have to come in to talk and what kinds of projects could I do to get ready for that to go require my time to You know, one of my favorite things is people who do projects and then invite people from the neighborhood. The guy who owns the hardware store, the guy who has the McDonald's franchise, doesn't have, doesn't have to be a fortune on the company. Come in and judge the projects. You know, have people from the community-based organizations that serve them and their family come into your classroom and judge those projects. Let them, because what you're teaching them is presentation skills. And I think presentation skills are important to me. And kindergarten teachers are very good at doing it. Today, Jane's going to come and tell me another fact. And you stand, I do go to kindergarten as well. But, you know, you know, you go and you see that they do it really well. When does a sixth grade teacher encourage kids to get up and present? Because they don't think it's not a mix. They think it's a waste of time for the other 29 kids. And they're worried about presentation. They're worried that people will make fun of the kids speaking and it'll it'll create a problem in the room. How do we give them the toolbox to say you can diffuse a situation that you have? And maybe you don't have individuals, but maybe what you do is have teams present to you. And therefore gives you a little bit of cover, both on your time on task and for the meeting, but also cover on making fun of one person. And the team decides who's the person going to speak. But think about that because this is this is this is never gonna change. You know, bus schedule, rules, the roost, the prep schedule. I mean, make, some schools are making real, real progress in common prep time. So the teachers who touch the same kids, especially in middle school and high school, have common prep time. I think that's great. But all of these things are going to be real. And you have, you, you have to teach all of these things. How do you deal with an administrator? How do you deal with a principal that's an old school thinker who could be 35 years old? but thinks that everybody needs to be in their seat and that walking around the classroom is a disaster waiting to happen. How do you deal with an administrator who thinks fair is when everybody in the room is doing exactly the same thing? I've run heads with principals my whole career because I would say, especially a teacher, I taught math as well as reading, even though I'm a reading specialist, and they would they would come into the room and I'd see things like, okay, where are the three hardest problems on this page? And everybody's like, ah, we have the last two problems on the page. Yeah, right, anybody who can do the last two problems I won't do the rest of the page. They'd be like, oh, I'm getting over. You know, I said, yeah, you can be If you can get the last <coughs> one on the page correctly, you're done. You move on to the next thing. A principal came, wrote me up on that, and said, it's not fair that every kid doesn't have to do every problem on the page. Why? I mean, they don't make us say our first words when we were babies, mama, before they talked to us. You know, I mean, it's so ridiculous. But I went, I went a long time with this particular principal who taught me to the deal. And, and I said to him then, and I, I, I say all the time when I think about that, fair is when every single person in the class gets exactly what they need to succeed. Period. That's fair. For me, if that's doing the two hardest problems, and then I go on to problem solving, so that's great. For somebody else, if they have to struggle through 30 problems on the page with my assistant, that's fair. So I think, I think keeping these things in mind that you don't want to set up prospective teachers or your grad students, quite frankly, that they're going to be at odds with the principal. But how do you explain to a principal what you're doing? There are some lousy teachers out there, and they need to be written up and gotten rid of. They need to go to work somewhere else. Period. End of statement. The vast majority of teachers are doing the best they can with what they have, and they need support. They need they need lifelong learning. And we'll get on to that because I think Drexel has a unique case there. Okay, so blah 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 blah. Something old, something new. 
professional development, career mobility, and that's uh, teaching in the 21st century, right? That's, that's going to be teaching. So let's talk for a minute about what the, the balance is. Teachers are always really good at delivering the things you need to learn to increase your academics. That's who they are. That's how they see themselves. So I don't think there's their technical skills. That was how it was for CTE back when they called it OK. I don't do technical skills. <coughs> well, those days are over. Every teacher has got to be able to instill and inspire their students to get technical whether it's using a screwdriver and a hammer, whether it's building things in your classroom, putting straws together, because if we don't give them some level of exposure from early elementary through high school, I don't care if they have perfect SAT scores and don't think they should take uh, a technical course. They have to know technical things. They have to be able to understand things at a technical level, and they certainly have to be able to do things with their hands because technology is going to be in every single job. So even if their technical skills are working on a software package or learning to code, but they don't have to be coders to learn to code. By the time they enter the workforce, coding may be something different. Java, you know, and R, they could all be Python, they could all be names that we look at, like we look at, you know, three channels having news at seven o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. You know, like the olden days. But they have to know that they have the ability to achieve a technical skill and some proficiency in that skill. So I, I don't care what it is at this point, but teachers have to talk about that and it can't be, you're not smart enough to go the academic track, you need to go to the vocation track. You know? And it can be things that they like to do so that it becomes really easy. How does a teacher decide and design their lesson so that technical skills are either present or noticed in those? And, you know, whether it's reading stories about people in the second grade who have technical skills and learning what that is, or whether it's something more dramatic. And then it's the personal skills. And, you know, when I, I, I was just with uh, the Business Roundtable last week, they have a wonderful initiative that I'd like to fill it up with a steel that's going from uh, Baltimore down to Richmond. They've gotten all the colleges and 14 of their employers to come together in a collaborative effort. And they're actually, it's called CoLab, you can Google it, I won't spend a lot of time talking about it, but they're instilling a three-core sequence that an English major could learn the basics of data analytics so that they could get a job, not as a data scientist, but they could get a job in HR knowing data analytics. And all 14 of these name recognized employers have promised that if you have this certificate as a plug into your existing program, if you have that certificate, they'll guarantee you an interview. So I think that's the way to the future. But so, but I, I don't want to stop on personal skills. Every one of those employers, and it was uh, Jamie Diamond and Wes Bush and uh, Marilyn, and all the, all the big CEOs were at this meeting. And they were all talking about, Marilyn used to be uh, Lockheed. And they were all talking about, you know, I get this guy who came out of a really good engineering program. He's dynamite, but he doesn't know how to work in food. Or I get this woman so thrilled to get a woman. I mean, you know, the, it's better than a lottery ticket to get a woman of color who's an engineer, right? right? I mean, so they they're really excited about it. They get there and they're like, I can't work with you. You know, they were because they went to engineering schools that were so competitive that you didn't let the person sitting next to you work. Right. You know, I mean, they were so the and and it's the same thing. I hear it in cyber. I hear it in data analytics. I hear it in robotics and machine learning. Different things. They don't have, they they know how to write great code, but they can't write a concise memo on what it means. That's right. <laughs> and they can't. They don't know how to express it to the C suite. They can't say to the the COO, "This is why we need to do this." They were like, "It's done. It's right. It's one hundred percent right." You know, here it is. And the COO said. <laughs> no, I'm not going to fight for that in a C-suite meeting. So these personal skills of communication, very different at different levels. I just mentioned getting along with people. I mean, the, the stuff about coming in on time, they get that. But, you know, on the previous slide, you saw intergenerational learning. And this is becoming a real pet peeve for a lot of HR people. Johnny Taylor, who's the new head of Sherm, watch him. He's really good. Uh, first time they've had uh, an African-American leading the Society of Human Resources Professionals. So you're going to see in your face, good, necessary, long overdue conversation about race. 
I, I'm and I, I'm a fan, you know that. So he wouldn't be offended having me say it, but he's really shaking things up about how HR professionals are recruiting, how HR professionals are assessing, and how they're moving people up or not once they get into a company. So you're going to see good things from there. But he he is somebody who really has put an emphasis on this personal skills because it's it's about how do I work within my peer group. How do I manage them? How do I treat my janitor? How do I teach, treat my executives, my secretary? You know, because they're not close to all day. And <coughs> how do I treat the elevator operator? And then how do I manage up? And you know, you think about that. If you're a teacher, that you have exactly the same ability. How do you treat your peers? How do you interact with your peers? How do you interact with me as the boss? I'm the teacher. How do you deal with the non-teaching assistants? How do you deal with the lunchroom moms, aides? How do you deal with the non-teaching people and the, and, the, and the teaching assistants? You know, a lot of schools have people who come in who are senior serve America, you know, foster grannies who come in and sit and read with younger kids. How do they teach them? How do they interact with them? And, you know, getting kids to think about that. You know, I used to see the toughest kid in school melt when one of the lunch mothers said, you. you know, and the kid would just melt. Not only because they were getting more food, but that person knows me and cares about me, knows that I like apples, and, is, and knows me as a person. So different than my big battle that I always had. Take your hat off. Take it on that hair. Put your pants on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about good morning? <laughs> yeah. How about good morning? Can you imagine if you went to work every day and people just told you, you know, you look terrible. What's the matter? You're getting sleepy. Like, it's really interesting to me that. So if they did, I think it would get those that that going. And employability skills go right with personal skills, actually. You know, uh, this is what employers call them. They used to call them soft skills. Finally, we got them off that because there's nothing soft about them. But what's your persistence? Do you have grit? You know, telling kids what does grit mean? Grit means that someone if you have to raise the problem three times, you go back and finish it. Grit means I really can't get you know that person to pay attention to me, and how do I do it? So I think this is really important, and this is one. I told you I was going to push Drexel here a little bit. Uh, you have the closed school of entrepreneurship. I think that the school of education should be in such close partnership. Not only, you know, I mentioned Paul Harrington. Not only should teachers understand statistics and and uh, labor market information, but they should really understand what are the skills that an entrepreneur has. What makes me buy that franchise? Even though you have more money, you're afraid to do it. What makes me say, my mom makes the best apple pie ever? I'm going to get her to sell it. Like, what makes that happen? Amos was a regular guy before he became famous Amos with his cookies, right? I mean, you think about it. What are those things that you could include as activities in your classroom and kind of assess? You know, I really just noticed you have great entrepreneurship skills. You may not be the best reader. You may not get the best grades on the test. But wouldn't it be great if everybody in the room knew that you really look like a budding business person? Not only for your self-esteem, but for them to say, oh, what about me? What about what is that? Help me get that skill. So I, I think that, again, Drexel has a unique opportunity because as you search to get your fair share of the market share of people who want to be teachers, you need to build, in my estimation, a program that shows how diverse you can be and what different tests. And that really goes into, you know, the fact that teachers have to understand they can't be the smart. They have to, there's no way, you know, it, it just, it can't, it can't happen because they can't be the master of all these things. And all these things are things you're, you're talking about all the time, things that we've mentioned already. The one that um, I haven't mentioned, but I feel very strongly about is competition. I love competition. And I didn't as a teacher. I thought, oh, they'll be losers. Like, I was wrong. Because competitions like robotics, competitions like Skills USA in, in the uh, technical world, competitions like One Dynamo and things like that, I, I, those are really interesting to me. And teachers could do them as an after school activity. And many of them do that with, with, with robotics. But getting them to see that as a real learning tool is. Because all those other things that I just had up there, how do you learn teamwork? Well, if you're in a high robotics team, you learn teamwork. Just like you do 
if you're if you're doing some of the skills you have anything is about being the best plumber or the best person, they have a competition where they put five people in the team and they have to build a house in eight hours. And the people who think you know part of the house is called the shed, you know, I mean they do. <laughs> This is what I call HGTV. <laughs> <laughs> I think they have been there, yeah. No, no it's exactly right. And of course, the time lapse is talking. Exactly. These kids really have to do it. So it's really, to me, it's very interesting. And we've talked about this. The one, the other thing that I would say is uh, Drexel has a unique opportunity to build a network because it's huge. Uh, whether a uh, virtual network or an in person network here, for those who are interested in your graduate, it's a great way for you to keep your graduates engaged. But the opportunity for them to talk to other third grade teachers who they are in competition with, the opportunity for them to learn what, what to teach third grade in Phoenix, Arizona, what it's like to teach third grade in Anchorage, Alaska, you know, how are kids just can't seem to get in the numbers? How do you, you, you can tell them the math code, that's why I always use math examples, because I, you know, I, for me, of course, I know a million ways to teach sequencing. I know a million ways to teach finding the main or an unstated stage or an unstated main idea. I, you know, because I, I was a reading person. So math was always hard for me, so I needed to find ways. How, I just can't get my kids to understand the negative numbers. How, you know, especially when the adders have dropped up, they really have a problem. And if they can get on a site, there are many sites which I'll give you a list of, but if they could get on a, a directional site where they could share that kind of stuff, it would be powerful. So the reason I think that we have a responsibility uh, to, you know, I, I get a pension from the state of Pennsylvania, so that tells you I put I, between my time in higher ed and my time in K-12, I was actually in my state pension. So I, uh, but I'm an example of people who didn't stay. That, that my experiences in education gave me alternative pathways that I enjoyed as much as I could teach and not more. Every job I've had, I've liked as much as I like, but I, I often say to the children of my husband and my family, I could go back to teaching in those schools more and be as happy as I am doing it with what I'm doing. I mean, because there's no job that's made me happier or more fulfilled or more challenged. But, you know, most teachers that you touch are not going to teach for their years. And what do you do to say to them? So when I was in school of education, people even dropped out right after they did student teaching, which was unfortunate for the second semester of their least students by first semester of senior year. But when I was in school, we had to be in a clinical setting every semester from first semester of freshman year. And you know, I taught, I knew when I chose my student teaching design of what I wanted. I was an urban girl. I didn't like suburban teaching, nothing wrong with it. I knew I wasn't crazy about early childhood. I knew I didn't want to teach in a hospital setting. I knew that I would rather kill myself than teach outdoor education. And <laughs> one semester I had to do an outdoor dance. It was the worst semester of my life. <laughs> you know, but I knew a lot about myself and what I liked. And you know, I think it's why I was so happy when I taught in Boston, but I taught when I came to Stetson, I knew exactly what I wanted. I couldn't deal with kids crying and wiping their nose on the side of me. Hearing F notes didn't bother me. You know, like having kids curse at me, I was like, yeah, 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 good, get them on. You know, I mean, it was like, that was fine with me. But I was not, I don't think every teacher, I know every prospective teacher doesn't get that. And I taught a lot, and very good friends with Wendy Cobb uh, thought about her because I was at the federal level when they were trying to go to scale. So I'm not an enemy of Teach for America, but I think there's nothing you can do with Christmas to get money for the competency. You know, I mean, so uh, I, when people say, oh, wow, Assistant Secretary of Labor, I always say, right, I started as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I have my degree in education. I'm an education person. So that they don't think that I have a Harvard policy degree. Not a little that, but I'm a teacher. The smarts that I have are because people taught me to be a teacher, period, and what I learned afterwards. So you think about where people are going to go, blah, blah, blah. They're going to go post-secondary. They're going to take my route short term. They're going to go into administration, although I never could understand that. Um, they're going to go into education policy. Thank God many of the people who are writing the laws on the Hill uh, are former teachers. Not enough of them. Uh, many of the people who are in these big think tanks, whether you Aspen or Heritage or AEI, any of those former teachers, which is really good uh, because at least they have some thimbleful reality. <laughs> but these these last four 
I guess last week was public policy was almost the same as education policy. But these, although we can argue that many teachers still need to be in, in welfare reform and get on the prison reform and things like that. But I want to talk for a second about education and technology, education startups and assessment. I don't know how many of you have heard of her family. She's the CEO of a company called Imbalance. She dropped out of Harvard. She has raised $250 million for her company herself. And her company is the code, the SAP, to start an assessment program that really talks about what, what skills do you need uh, to be college ready. And she would argue career ready. Did I mention she's 27? Oh, ouch. Yeah. So I would I would say to you that this shows the world. She was not an education major. She probably would have jumped out of education major. <laughs> but the the bottom line is it shows you the speed at which people can make a mark for themselves in education startups and education technology. Women, by the way, represent because most of your students are still female. More it's getting more equal. I hope every year, but. You know, <coughs> still mostly women. More women. Than women. Oh, well, uh, so uh, in 2018, women got 3% of the angel investment money. 3%. People of color got 1%. Of all the angel investment for startups. But of that 3% that women got and 1% that people of color got, 50% of the money went to education technology and ed startups. So people of color and women are much more interested in going in to this, how do we reform education? No surprise, right? I mean, women like to solve problems and people of color too often have seen their community held back because of lack of opportunity. So if you think about this, a lot of the people you teach are gonna be going there. They're gonna see things that are wrong in curriculum. They're gonna, they're gonna see things that are wrong in enrollment management. They're gonna see things that are wrong in how schools operate and they're gonna fix it. And one of the ways they're going to fix it is they're going to start their own company. So think about that as you're preparing teachers, because if teachers, teachers are the original, I guess Noah was the original entrepreneur. <laughs> Forget Noah for now. But teachers are such entrepreneurs because 99% of their professional life, they're the only adult who's paying attention. <laughs> Right? I mean, principal may come in twice a year, you may get some parents, you may have some volunteers, you may have that, but they are the captains of their own ship. How different is that than being a CEO? Except that they have their customer chomping at the bit 24 7. <laughs> you know? I mean, that, so get letting teachers know that it's okay to have these, these you know, irritations of sin, that maybe I'd like to start my own company sometime. That, that would really be interest, interesting to just bring into your question and to bring some of these educational entrepreneurs into meet with teachers. Because even if teachers didn't want to start their own company, they should certainly be on the board of these companies and they should be advising them. There are almost, I ask all the time when companies, you know, forget the boards that pay $250,000, but like when I, I'm on the board of a couple startups and I say, you know, well, does anybody have some teacher money? And they're like, no. <laughs> Think about it. All right, I told you I'd give some resources, and Penny will have this. Uh, so don't, but these, are, these are resources that too often are never mentioned in. I did a survey of the uh, teachers' colleges in Los Angeles and uh, asked them if they knew any of these. And uh, a couple of people wrote me and asked me notes about using Quizlet in the problem. Why wouldn't a teacher make their own quiz? Why? Adding whole numbers. Why do I need to? I mean, I lived in the age of making a mimeograph and doing the machine <laughs> and smelling like chemicals, right? Why? Why can't you put that on every kid's tablet if you have tablets in your room? I'm talking like it, it, the, 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 the lack of equity in the material is disgusting. But why, why couldn't you put that in front of kid? Why couldn't you put a Quizlet thing and, and then you would say to the kids, we're going to compete with people in Omaha today? You know, like, wow, we're smarter than. We, you know, we at uh, the, the Mayfair Elementary School are smarter than the people in Omaha. That's like a cool thing, and it takes five minutes. And you didn't have to spend the five minutes figuring out, oh, did I use six plus four already? Let me use it, you know? So I think that um, discovery in PBS, unbelievable. PBS, much more, uh, people think about it. But using videos as conversation starters, as levelers, 
you know, to kind of level the field because you're going to have kids who watch smart television in their own homes. I don't care how poor or rich the kids are. Kids are really interested. Uh, back when I was at Stetson, I had kids who knew more about the mating life of the brown bear and the sex habits of the sperm whale than I would ever know because they saw it on television. Mm -hmm. You know, and they remembered every word. You know, no, I don't know how many times sperm whale to me. I have no idea, <laughs> but they did. But that's that's accelerated so much now that you have little geniuses in every classroom. They might not be able to read the words, but they have really good numbers, they're really smart, and they can remember everything. Why wouldn't you expose the kids that don't know they have that learning avenue to that learning avenue? And why wouldn't you level the playing field, show a three minute video about that brown bear, and now we can all talk lovely, and it's not going to just be because you know about the brown bear. You have to think about how many things and how many times that happens. A video, something can be exposed, and everybody, thanks to Channel One and Chris Whittle, everybody <laughs> in, in Philadelphia has to use the TV in their room. Ed Helper is great, it's the same thing, but I want to talk. All these, all these are uh, things that I've spent a lot of time on, but the one that I like best is We Are Teachers. It's a free site for teachers by teachers. And it's everything that you can imagine. It's how to do, uh, one of my favorites is, how to do science experiments in a fifth grade classroom with no lab when the principal doesn't like the kids out of their seats. So, <laughs> you know, really interesting. Really interesting things. How do I do parent learning? How do I do peer tutoring? How do I, and then actual stuff, including lesson plans. So why wouldn't we give, obviously, everybody that you teach has to learn to write a lesson plan. How to think about it, how to think about their teaching, not to just walk in and say, whoops, you missed the bell, here's what am I gonna do today? You know, every, that's part of what you've trained them. You, you teach them that that's a bad teacher that comes in and goes by the seat of his or her pants. But why wouldn't we give them these other ways? I mean, people talk about uh, Socrates. And you know, some of our teachers have great Socrates and some of them haven't. And they all kind of know who was the smart guy a long time ago who liked to talk to people and he liked this course. But if you could figure out you were going to teach the Battle of the Bulge, not to die on the industry, <laughs> uh, you know, if you were going to teach that, what is the way that Socrates would teach that? How would you do it in the classroom? You should you waste your time thinking about that? You might think of a better one after you do it one time, but why wouldn't you give yourself that quick start and take some of the pressure off? So, Please, uh, if you don't know uh, all of these, I'm sure many of you know most of them, but if there's a new one on there, please look at it. Yeah. I was going to say, you had entrepreneurial on your yeah. previous slide. While, it, while things are not curated, if they're not on the either, you should have teachers pay teachers. No, that's so, exactly right. So that's that's a, a little entrepreneurial spike for seeing the teacher. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. And you know, the, the other thing that I should mention is the funding. You know, uh, and donors choose. Donors so choose. donors choose is the big one. You know, now there's school districts who are saying no to them because they don't think it's fair. Yeah. Is that it's okay? okay. <laughs> yeah, right. And let's hope. But I mean, you're exactly right. That's really that's, that's a very good point. I'll end that one slide. So you're So now we're here from you. I think I've talked long enough. I'd love uh, questions or comments. By the way, I don't think I know everything, but I do know uh, as my personal test that I uh, go everywhere that I'm invited, and I have really a key here. And I take copious notes. I always have red books when I leave a place to take notes because that's what we do. Right? That's what we do. Um, and so I don't forget to say it again, thank you for choosing because to me, it is going to be the rise or fall of our society. Education is still, love it or hate it, education is still the great equal. And every kid in first grade, in fifth grade, in eighth grade, in twelfth grade has the right teacher in the end. So thank you for what you But questions, comments? A lot. It's a hard question. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? No. Oh, I know you're going to ask me a hard question. This is a little bit different. Yeah. It's, it has to do with. Um, and Andrew, everybody knows you. Everybody's here with us one day. Jenny was nice enough to invite me. I felt very special. <laughs> Extremely special. I've been bragging to other people about it, just so you know. Um, question to you, because the work that I do is all about civil rights. It's all, it's, we talked about it the last time I was here, the difference in equality and equity. Um, how would you get both students and uh, parents Involved in education, 
I know you believe that they have a serious role in like what happens in the school, the principals, the teachers. How would you get them to advocate for themselves? So I think giving students voice is really uh, a little bit easier than parents, but I'm going to talk about both. I think letting students decide certain things, starting with things that don't make a big difference in your class and hopefully moving up to how you run your classroom and how the school is run, really important. I mean, I've seen some schools do it around lunch programs and food. I've seen other schools do it around what are the things that happen in classes like art and music. I mean, we've seen nationwide a huge outpouring about the, um, the, the refusing to accept ending arts programs, you know, particularly performing arts. But, you know, I one of the things I say when I'm in school is this, who picks the after school programs? Who decides what's going to be and if those are wonderful opportunities for teachers they get paid their hourly rate they supplement their income they don't have to go to a second job uh, they don't have to teach Evelyn Wood like I did you know but they don't have to uh, but who decides that and too often students are not involved in that choice at all and then people wonder why they can't keep their numbers up so they still get their EC paycheck their extra paycheck you know I mean I think so I think extracurricular is really a point where, at the least, at the very least, the students do it. And now with things like Survey Monkey, you could do that really simply. It's, it doesn't it wouldn't take somebody making a grid and doing this and you know having the thermometer in the front of the, the front of the building and saying where are we and who wants this. And but it would really be uh, a great democratization if kids could choose. I also think you know getting kids to tell you. Who the after school programs are outside of your school building that they really like and trust. So do they go to the Boys and Girls Club? You know, do they go to the CYO? Do they go wherever it is? You know, every everybody has their program. So that you could bring some of that into the school and if they didn't have to travel there, because look, the reality is if you're in an urban or rural setting or suburban, moving from point A to point B is dangerous. You get hit by car, right? I mean you get struck by lightning. So if you didn't have to move, I think that makes it a little bit easier. So I think learning from them about what they want to do and then asking them hard questions about what are things you don't want to do. You know, I think I think that would be really uh, a way to do it. Parents, uh, I'm going to be brutally honest here, and not just because I saw the tendency to give it to my opioids, but I, I understand why <coughs> teachers and administrators are a little bit reluctant to bring parents in. For many, for many of our students, parents are part of the problem, not part of the solution, in their minds. Um, every kid loves their mom, every, every kid loves their dad. But I, so I, I don't feel as easy doing broad brush strokes on parents, but I think it's very important to bring them in. And uh, in the 21st century more than ever, it's important to bring them in because everybody has to commit to lifelong learning. So if there were a way to bring parents in on their own turf. Uh, so whether it, when I was at Stetson, uh, Penny will remember this grant, I, I wrote a grant to a health clinic. We were one of the first health clinics in Philadelphia in a school building, funded by Robert Lee Johnson. But then that same year, I funded having uh, laundry machines because the biggest problem in North, my part of North Philadelphia at that time, there were no laundry mats and people didn't have washers and dryers or their washers in their homes. Uh, so, we had a program where if you came for a PTA program, whatever it was, <coughs> you could do your laundry while you were at the program. And it solved two problems. You can imagine middle school and junior high, kids sleep. You can sleep when the youngest kid went to West to bed or they went to bed themselves, or they just sweat. And there would be lots of cooling and eyeing it in. Oh, she stinks, and he stinks, and he's dirty, and she's dirty. We got rid of all of that because the parents could come in and it cost us we took donations you know people could pay if they can pay but there was no set fee and uh, we always made sure that there were going to turkeys there no no fancy stuff no you know dryer sheets and I don't think they had them there. but there was always detergent and we got donations from the local stores as well who understood the problem and wanted people to like them so we had signs up saying you know that the Grocery the the bodega on D in Allegheny gave us three things of laundry detergent. You know what I mean? But I I think I think bringing I think we we 
we recognize that parents are tremendously paid. You know, whether they're working, can you imagine working three part time jobs and dealing with those crazy supervisors saying, well, if you can't be here Tuesday at 10, you don't have a job here anymore. Well, I have to be Tuesday at 10 my other job. You know, um, and the rising cost of transportation, their own cars, insurance, etc. Um, and, and uh, you know, they're just like us. Every parent is just like us. They have siblings who need their help at different times. Their aging parents need their help at different times. Their kids need their help. They just feel like they're full of manager and they don't have our education many times and our social <coughs> So I think bringing them in to solve one of their, their problems, very simply, having a job fair for parents, having a resume writing thing for parents instead of just talking about your kid. Let's talk about you. How can we help you? You've been out of the workforce for a couple of years. How can we help you? And, you know, I'm going to push this back right here because that's who I am. Bringing somebody like your to do that. You don't need, you, the teacher, you don't have to know how to write a resume, but you could bring an outside resource in, and it's a simple. That outside resource is happy to come and do it, and you're building their brand, their base, and you're building a bridge between you and them so that maybe when they have summer internships, they'll come to your high school instead of going to Central or Burbs. Is there a girl? Yes. There's a girl. There's a girl. Yeah. I mean, that's, I always have to worry, right? Because there's still a master. Because there's still a come back, there's no way to pen, right? I mean, there's, so, but I mean, I think, I think, I think the, if I had to speak in broad strokes, the best thing I would do, and, and by the way, this time of year, I think every school should be having a workshop on uh, for parents on how to do the year and much better. I think it's a disgrace that we have that ability for people to make under twenty-two thousand dollars a year, and every year less than fifty percent of the people who are eligible for school. You know, and schools schools should be a community resource. They should be a catalyst for economic development and and equity. And you know, I, I like so much because it's who the the program the is. But you are exactly right. We do a great job of diversity. I can head count girl, boy, girl, woman of color, woman of color, woman of color. You know, I, I can do that head count. We do a lousy job in America on inclusion. We, you know, we can get the numbers there. I had five black women last week. Good for you. And what did you do to make sure they had a career path within the organization? And the answer with most employers is, well, I hired them. I hired them. I hired them. You know, so giving. Giving that kind of thing to parents, how do you get to the next level? That's terrific that you got a part-time job at Macy's. That's great. How do we make sure you can have a parlay that to talk of instead of just saying part-time job at Macy's, how do we make sure you know how to put that on a resume to show your customer relations skills, to show your timeliness, to show your project management, whatever it was, on a resume? How do we help you put that there? And then how do we help you build a LinkedIn profile? Because you know, LinkedIn right now is, I hate to say this, it's doing away with resumes for many positions. People need to look for you and me. I mean, I'm sure many of you look at my LinkedIn profile before you came today. It's what, before I have a meeting with people, I look at their LinkedIn profile. You know what I mean? To see, oh, they have the same college I did. I have something to say in the conversation. So, how do we get parents to understand this? And how do we get them to understand technology? I think a lot of families would come in if schools would do. Very simple, short, you know, small light technology. How do you? We talked about uh, Paul Harrington. Get Paul Harrington in here to do a short labor market information session. You know, I mean, that would be they go off the You know, like they do that, they're like crazy, and they would have learned a lot. So how how do you use the resources? How do you teach your prospective teachers to use the resources at Drexel in the city in their neighborhoods? Because now you go to teach in a neighborhood like Kensington, you know, or Strawberry Mansion, or West Philly, and you think, oh, you know, I'm going to kill myself. Oh, I'm going to kill. Instead of looking at what are the resources? What, you know, everybody goes to Richmond to go to stock state. You know, why not bring stocks in to talk about how they maintain for 100 years or whatever they've been in business, the most amazing bakery in Philadelphia? You know, I mean, how do you, how do you talk about that? How do you, how do you bring those resources? And I think teachers don't know. I just have one yeah, question, please. and that's it. Okay. So, um, how do I relate the 63% and the 37% you talked about that are engaged in the to the unemployment rate? You know, uh, uh, to the chagrin of the Department of Labor and BLS, even in the Obama administration, it's very it's it's an in the weeds conversation and that sexy topic of unemployment and now in public issues it's seen as well look what I've done instead of you know 
it's wonderful. Look, when I was in the Obama administration, we had to look at 17 and 19 percent unemployment rates in some parts of this country, and 29 and 30 percent uh, raise during the recession in communities of color and, and uh, in some geographic areas. It was horrible. But the labor market participation rate is the rate of people working age defined by prime age from 25 to 6 to 53. How many of them are engaged in the company and the work? So it's never going to be 100%, right? People drop out because of sickness. People drop out because they're pregnant with parenting. People drop out because they decided to retire a little early because they had a windfall, whatever. You know, they drop out. But it, it is every month we're hitting a new level. And what that means for a community, a community like I grew up in Francisville, you know, in the Jesuit parish, means that instead of going up and getting to work every day, 37% of the people are choosing to stay home or feeling like they're forced to stay home because they don't have an opportunity to get a job. And what does that do to the community? What do people do when they lose hope? What do people do when they despair? What do people do when they're idle? Not good stuff usually. It's not really where you think of Bill Gates coming up with the next big idea. You know, I mean, it's, it's so what do we do to make sure that we get in a, in a perfect world, and thank God there's not a labor economist here, but in my mind, it should be somewhere between 65 and 70. And if you think about what that means when you're a country of 162 million workers, it's a lot of people. And when you think about what that means in a community like Philadelphia, where you have huge pockets of people who happen to be given opportunity. I mean, look, the league and Leon Sullivan were working on Broad Street when I was a kid, right? There, there was an inequality in opportunity in the 50s and 60s. It has, that gap has gotten bigger, not smaller. So I think we want to get that. And, and while we celebrate, the unemployment rate really most accurately only covers those people who are on unemployment insurance. So it doesn't cover anybody who suffers for it. You know, if you're one of those day workers, you don't, you're not eligible for unemployment. If you have, a, and, and right now, in a robust economy like we're supposed to be having, which you know, that's a discussion every day for me because it's not a robust economy for everybody, when in January we had 6 million people who were late on their car payments. Those people who could afford a car knew enough to have a car payment and they were late, highest number in the 2016, which is only about 10 years, so it doesn't go back as far as some of the other stuff. 6 million people were late on their car payments in January. What do you do with that fact besides work? But when you look at uh, how you move forward in communities that are really strapped, how do you teach them things? And it teaches them that that 4% is only a fraction of the real story. And while we celebrate, again, don't get me wrong, and, and I'm not making a political statement, I don't think there, I, I, I want it to be 4%. That's close to full employment, I want that. But there are many, many people, people of color, women, uh, people old, what I, what I would call older workers, AARP's definition is 55 and older, who can't get a job in 26 weeks and are now long term unemployed with no cash benefit coming in. So they're going to things like maybe permanent disability that they don't need, which is crippling our economy. Maybe they're going to under the table work where they get no worker protection, they not paid Social Security, they may not be paid the 40 quarters that you need to pay to get Social Security when they turn 66. So all these things are bad things. I, I don't mind people making hustle, side hustle money. That doesn't bother me. But if you're not paying somewhere in the social security, you are really risking not having the three quarters. And then all of a sudden you're 66 or 62 if you want to plug early and there's nothing for you. Thank you for being Yes. Yeah. Larry. Larry. Thank you. No, I do not. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> the, owl, I I, the owl is watching you, Larry. The owl is watching. Of course, I'm in Philadelphia, so I would say the owl's watching you. I'm just curious about your take on the advantages and disadvantages of cyber escapes. So, um, you know, I think that online education, I'm a big fan of cyber, by cyber, do you mean cyber security schools or? Well, I think more, there are a lot of uh, big problems with cyber schools. So I woke up this morning to a thing from the LA Times, which I, I so they there are two people in LA that are charged schools and they have insights. You don't really become billionaires by charge schools. I would say the same thing is happening with cyber schools. Uh, there are some really uh, competent online programs 
in high school. I mean, they started with Syracuse. Syracuse had one of the first ones where they would do kind of these online programs uh, and, and they delivered quality education. I think the problem, you know, the, the growth in homeschooling scares me. Um, and the homeschooling is growing because of these opportunities online where they feel like they can get a physics program or because I really believe a big part of education is the team, the learning, the community. But look, I think I would not want it's, it's like I wouldn't want my whole diet to be pineapples. And I think when you go to one of these totally online programs, you end up eating a very limited educational diet. And I think, but I, I'm not against them uh, for bringing programs in. I think it's a terrible thing if you're in a rural district and you can't find a highly, highly qualified right. teacher that can do physics, chemistry, and biology. And they love biology and they kind of can't hard to do physics and chemistry. And somebody has a right to have somebody who really loves chemistry and really loves physics. So I'm not a fan of the standalones, to be honest with you. Uh, I haven't seen any data because the federal government doesn't demand any data collection on a couple. Uh, some of them have gone now, but there were a couple governors who were really holding the last, the, the, the former governor, I don't know, and the current governor in Tennessee didn't talk about it. Tennessee was like a place where a lot of this was going on. There were a lot of people doing these online high school programs. Uh, they didn't get a state diploma, um, which is a problem because you need a state recognized diploma. But he really harnessed them in. And, uh, he was a very poor teaching member, but the new governor has, has continued that. Um, the new governor of Connecticut has expressed some interest in it because I think there's a lot of people in Connecticut that are doing send your kids to the good high school. They do these online high school programs as well. I mean, I'm not sure I really want my kids in the same way. But I, I don't know. I, so I don't, I wish somebody would collect some data on it. The reason Tennessee comes to my mind is the collective data is shut them down. If they weren't, weren't having completers, if they weren't passing the state assessment, who forced all these online schools to take the Tennessee assessment because the resident wanted to attend Tennessee? I think that's the way we will be accountable, uh, accountable, the same as charter schools. If they're not taking the same assessment as regular traditional public schools, then I'm not ready to say they're better or worse, but we need to, we need to have a, a line where we measure. I do think that um, the online high school programs for adults very interesting in what's going on there. There's a couple, I, I, I'm hesitant to mention their names because I don't want to sell any of them, but I really like what's happening because GED is a waste of time and money. I hate to say that to anybody who's not over to get a GED, <laughs> but you can't get into college, you can't get into a community college with GED. You know, and now that we think the federal government has screwed up the ability to benefit, it makes it harder and harder. So that GED is very expensive. You know, the new GED, the way ACB has designed it, five tests. And when we all did it at the temple, when we uh, when we moved on to test, you really had you could pass test one, but then a year later you could test test two, a year later you could test test three until you had it all ready. So the ACA is designed for the year. You don't pass all five of them in the same year, you have to take what it is. I don't know many uh, 40 year olds who could go back and take all five of the GED tests in one year. You know, and, and with you know, I mean, and you know, raise their children to do their jobs, a lot of them. So I like some of these online high school diploma programs that are coming out because you get a regular state recognized high school diploma, which is much more noble, and you get some kind of certificate in something. Some of them are using a new retail certificate, which is very entry level, but you know, gets you in the door in retail. Some of them are using the MSSC, the base uh, manufacturing credential. You know, and you can choose which credential you want. I like those a lot better because they recognize that the adults are going back to school, not doing well in the morning, but they get done. We have time for one more question. Thank you so much. It was great. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa Gold, because this was fun. I've never seen the owl before. The app. <laughs> so it's gonna be a little Mario, right? Exactly. It's a little possible for you. So we um I'll break the heart. I wanna thank you so much. And we have a gift for you, even though I like to And it's blue yellow. Yeah. Yes, it's blue and yellow. So thank you so much. Can we get Jane a round of Thank applause? you. Thank you.
and please, I should have done my commercial, go to workingnation.com and send yes. me ideas. Because we're looking for solutions, and we've done a lot of events at four-year colleges and uh, universities, but most of the programs we've identified are community colleges. So really, send me ideas, and tell me what's, what you like about it and what you don't like. We do short videos, um, usually another five minutes. And uh, we use some animated stuff, uh, especially when we get a good Hollywood star to do it with us, because that drives up viewership. Anthony Anderson is my current favorite. Um, but um, tell me what you think. I mean, we're two and a half years old. I've been in the head of it for two years, and we really uh, like to walk the walk. I, I'm telling you how things have to change. We need to get in touch. So please take a look at the ideas. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know it's we all go to the gym and you say you do vision yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We all have lots of <laughs> and there he is. Yeah. Mario. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. See? 